Hi everyone, and welcome to another uh, episode of the GCS Connect Leader Series. Uh, we've got Jenny Cox here today with us. Uh, she's both a security, a cyber security manager for Tenable, as well as the head of communications for Cyber Women Ireland. Um, so a busy lady wearing lots of hats. Um, we've had a great conversation, um, really with regards to you know, firstly cyber, but also you know the way that you can build customer services and best practice while continuing to think about diversity. So Jenny's got a lot of interesting stuff to, to teach us um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to, I'm sure you enjoy this conversation. Hi Jenny, how are you? I'm good, I'm good David, how are you? Good, very well, yes, nice to, nice to see you. Um, and uh, yeah, great to, to have the kind of conversation. So for our listeners, uh, we're speaking to Jenny Cox today. Um, she is both the head of communications for uh, for uh, Cyber Women Island um, and also the security engineering manager for Tenable. Um, so busy, busy lady. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll kind of go through that in a bit more detail. But um, great to, to see you, Jenny. I think um, our... Uh, People won't know, but we've, well, this is our take two, isn't it? We've done this, we've done this interview before, and it was great. So if we've just said if we can't, we can't hit the heights on this one, then it will be like the lost recordings of, of Jenny and David, <laughs> and, you know, the director's cut or something like that. So, so it's it's, it's great to speak to you again. Um, and uh, you know, we we spoke at the start of the summer. But obviously we're now speaking again in October, lots of lots of things have happened since then. But um, the thing I always get get people to do is just just give me a little bit of a flavor about yourself, your roles, um, and um, you know how you've how you've really kind of got involved in in obviously particularly the kind of the, the cyber women island um, and how that how you, you know how you feel that's kind of you know changing and you know progressing with what you're doing. Absolutely. So when it came to I guess getting into tech first, um, I fought it. I fought it hard as a teenager. It wasn't something that I necessarily wanted to do, but it seemed that um, no matter what I did, I was I leaned I leaned towards it. So I went to work in an admin role in a tech company about seventeen years ago and logging cases into a support queue. I got familiar with those cases, started answering the questions, moved into the support team. Then I got a role there and built up all of my um, experience and knowledge then through work as such. My actual training when it comes to college and degree work is in theater studies, radio, drama, and then later in psychology. So it couldn't be more polar opposite to what people would traditionally consider all things tech. Um, I spent 11 years working for that company and eventually became their IT coordinator. So maintaining all of their systems, networks, new starters, servers, patching, upgrades, all everything that could fall under the realm of uh, their internal IT systems I looked after. And then I wanted to go into cybersecurity. So I took the leap into a role in um, Tenable where I did frontline support. It was a, a coming down as such it, with regards roles, but it was a bigger global company and much more opportunity I felt to kind of grow in there in an area I was interested in doing. Uh, so over the seven years there, then I have moved from support to senior to principal and then across to being an associate SE because that was brand new to me, then to an SE, then to a senior and now an SE leader. And I have three teams across the globe that I looked after there. And then during my time with Tenable, I got involved in some technology. Things. You've you've ended up being a, a real specialist and, and obviously that I guess that would mean you really enjoy it and love it. So <laughs> I do. And like yeah. say, I fought it only as a teenager because when I was a teenager and um, working in tech was just not the done thing for a girl. It was very much a, a something that a guy did. And my two brothers both um, went to work in tech. I'm the only one of the girls or six of us all together, four girls. Okay. Um, I'm the only one that went to work into tech. Mm -hmm. So um, it was interesting, like I say, to, to fight it some ways along the way just because I wanted to be cool. Do you know, and now I'm on the other end of it and it's still really cool. So yeah. clearly I had to break all my own um, glass ceilings and boundaries in that sense. <laughs> then when it came to, to Cyber Women Ireland, I was doing B-sides with um, Tenable. Uh, we were main, a man on one of the desks such for the day, meeting various people because we supported every year um, in Dublin and then in London. And I met someone from Cyber Women Ireland and we were talking about returnships for people that, you know, come back after extended leave, maybe as carers and such. 
and one thing led to another and through her then I got involved in Cyber Women Ireland and then this year I was made the head of communications for it. So that is a, an interesting role, I guess lots of opportunities to speak which I'm never afraid to do, um, but more importantly, I get to put um, women in cyber at the forefront. And um, from your, is, is, so Cyber Women Island, is that, is that a kind of global, you know, so is there a Cyber Women UK and a Cyber Women France, US, that sort of thing? So pretty much every country has their own version of it. There's no like name and convention or it's not owned by any global authority as such there. What's happened over time, like, for example, you'd have a group like YSIS, which is Women in Cyber, um, and they are global and they have their own groups globally as such within that community there. Um, but Cyber Women Ireland has been started independently um, about three years ago, and we're getting into our official launch within the next few months. Um, we have like we've got partnerships with the Polish cyber women as well and with some UK groups too and we welcome those kind of connections between them all but they're very much all of those groups would have begun with a handful of women independently setting them up and then you know meeting and networking and, and stretching the groups then <coughs> from there it's not too formal because sometimes what happens with a super formal group like that is you become so aligned to um a, a compliance or a set way of doing things that you lose the nature that you intended yeah. as the original group where it's about networking and community and support and actually getting women into the roles in cyber as opposed to it being a tick, tick box exercise for any greater community from there it's much more we want to keep that that consistent approach and I'm, I'm assuming like you, your members maybe of cyber security groups as well right so more like tech cyber security groups and um, do, do you find the, the the where do you find it kind of change obviously it changes it because it's a different type of kind of focus as it were but two questions really number one do you think that having a women only group therefore allows women to to put forward ideas and share and communicate better because there's not loud men just talking over them and secondly um, do you think that does it does it really kind of get into tech technical chats? You know, do you kind of sit down and say like, what's the the best thing that a CSO a CSO can do? Because it doesn't in the end you all like you all do the same type of job, right? It doesn't matter whether you're male or female or you know what country you're in or whatever. So I mean, there's two questions there. Firstly, do you think that helps different type of conversation because it's female only? And secondly, does that conversation happen quite a lot? So yeah, in both cases, yeah. So when it comes to does it help us being sort of women only, mm. um, what tends to happen in, in a group like this is it begins um, out of a need for that support group. Mm. I have often been the only woman on my team. So to have another woman who gets the problems, which are not as bad now as they would have been 15 years ago, but um, to have another woman understand that or have another woman have my back or have another woman hold me up when I'm doing something well, yeah. Um, they're the, the kind of shortfalls we find with women in tech. So we're not very good at telling people, yes, I am good at this, or I did a great job or accepting the, the kudos for the work that we have done. But um, to have that community support us and do that and push us forward when we need that little nudge um, is really important. But what's also important is to have the, the male um, supporters within that community as well. So whilst we are called Cyber Women Ireland, we do welcome the male supporters in there too. And we can't, no woman um, group of any kind, IT and otherwise, can actually make the changes if we don't have male advocates that feel supportive towards it then as well. Yeah. You know, we can and then, and then create our own group and our own little yeah. inside. Yeah. And then it becomes a technology. Exactly. Group. You need to have it there. You need to have yeah. it. Yeah. So, so obviously one of the, the key things about your career and that we speak about within the podcast is obviously kind of leadership and moving into, you know, kind of a senior role and you... You said that you started as a, you know, obviously a kind of coordinator, really, and kind of have worked your way up in the in the classic sense. Um, you know, when you've when you've worked through to, to being a leader in, in two areas of the business, obviously a leader in both in terms of the cyber women, but also in terms of your organisation as well. Um, <clears throat> what what are the kind of challenges that you've you've encountered as you have you've been on that, you know, as you've been on that that journey? Um, and have been have they been different within different companies or 
was it a kind of a journey that you saw happening you know that you really pushed yourself towards getting there so a lot of things I've learned about becoming a leader um, would I've actually probably learned more about it through mentoring other people who are also becoming leaders or being mentored by people who have become leaders. And that's helped me learn what's consistent with my journey and theirs, as opposed to me thinking I'm isolated in this approach. But what I've learned is that for most people, when they want to move into leadership, the biggest challenge is that you tend to hit a brick wall, like people moving into any industry for the first time. They want X number of years of experience before you can go into that role. Um, And I found it, um, I had proven myself as an individual who would stand out from the team and do things beyond the norm. Um, And then trying to find opportunities to prove that I could also lead, um, which meant taking on more work beyond the norm then as well to show I could do that. That's something that it took me a while to kind of, figure out how to do that because when you become a leader as well it's less common that you are led to become a leader it's something that people assume that you do naturally and you know you just trip into these opportunities and you figure out how to do it as you go on the fly um but mentorship is a massive thing when it comes to that if you have an opportunity to talk to somebody who is already in a leadership role or has been in a leadership role or is open to hiring people in leadership roles that they can talk to you about how to get into to these things or what the expectation would be um, on the higher end side of it. I um, actually studied two courses when it came to management so I could tick that box, even though they're very textbook, like I studied one with the Open University and my own time and I studied one with the Institute of Management in Ireland as well, so that I could say I have had management training. Yeah. Whilst I often find management training by the book is all about how to run an average business and do everything in an average way, when the reality is I want to be an above average leader with an above average team. Most people do want to do that. And how do I succeed beyond knowing how it should be done? When it came to those things, I learned most of that through getting out and meeting other people in the industry, learning what works, but most importantly, investing in the human side of things. Mm. All of the technical skills and all of the buy the book business, anybody can learn how to do that. But if you can invest your time in your people and how to get the best out of them and how to have difficult conversations and how to, you know, empower your people on your team to um, to, to step forward or do things outside of their comfort zone themselves, that's where the difference um, really happens. And that kind of train, some of it I would have picked up through studying psychology anyway. And then more recently, I, I studied design thinking um, while I was on leave with COVID, not leave. And while I was on lockdown with COVID, I wasn't on leave, but I, I you had time to study. Working, so right? I took that then and I was like, absolutely, yeah, leave is the wrong word. <laughs> but doing those kind of things and applying it to a team and applying, like everybody was struggling with the similar challenges, being empathetic, having open conversations and allowing, allowing and enjoying the success of other people in my team. That's what makes a massive difference, I think. Yeah, yeah. And those open university courses that you did, did you do those off your own back? Did you think, like, this is is something I should do? Um, Or was it suggested, like, by Um, HR or just one of a mentor or whatever, or provided by your company? The Management Institute one I did off my own back. The open university one we have, we're lucky enough in in Tenable to have a, a professional development grant that we get every year so I used mine towards that in the year before I was planning to go for a management role so I could get that one <coughs> um, done there. but that said the open university has always been relatively affordable but more importantly something that you can squeeze around your regular hours like I did I studied psychology through the open university and I did it whilst I was pregnant with my now 15 year old and I had him during my time studying that course so because of the flexibility and I don't have to do a nine to four college day, I was able to fit the, in at, you know, two o'clock to four o'clock when I'm awake anyway in the morning dealing with him wow. to read wow. books and stuff yeah. while I'm waiting for him to settle. It sounds kind of dramatic. It was not that he was great. He was a really great <laughs> child. I was really lucky. <laughs> but to I be able to do my, those things and make it. Was it three, I couldn't have done any open university uh, courses. at two school, you know? <laughs> I was, I was cool. very lucky. All the others weren't quite as agreeable. <laughs> and so, so obviously one of the things you do within within you know cyber women in, in ireland is is talk to other women um and other people that want to become leaders you know what was 
you know, what are the, the key pieces of advice that you give them? What, what do you, you know, sit down and say, like, these are the things you've got to be aware of? So I would suggest a few things for anyone that wants to go into it. I would say for starters, get involved in mentorship. Even if you don't think you have something to offer somebody else, which I absolutely didn't think I did the first time I went into mentorship. So I became a mentor and a mentee at the same time because I figured, well, I can learn from, I can do my sessions with my mentor before I do my sessions with my mentee. So I can figure out how this works as I go was my logic. But as a result, that my very first mentee that I ever had was a guy and um, we still meet on the regular now. He's in a completely different part of the industry that I'm in, which I thought was going to make it much more of a challenge. But it turned out we have a great relationship. He's you know, done lots of things outside of his own comfort zone and developed on the head of conversations that we've had. But more importantly, I've learned because I'm speaking to somebody um, on a, a on an even level who has no qualms about being honest with me. They're not worried because I'm their boss. They're not worried because they're trying to get a job with me or anything like that. He has no reason to be anything other than honest with me. So if I ask him about, you know, what about trying X, Y, and Z? And he's going, uh, uh-uh, no way would I do that. That's awful because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. You know, it, it helps me to learn about what approach works from a human perspective then too. So as a result of that, I kept mentoring. I took on more. I had, um, I have 28 I've done since I started. Some of them are still ongoing and 23 of those were female. And I've seen through little changes and little exercise with it, massive changes on my side and for some of them anything from job changes to salary increases to promotions and even a few of them with awards because of small changes that way and I've learned how to advise them in doing small changes in a way that feels safe and secure and supported while they do it and I think good leadership is about making sure that people can take those risks with your support and the security that you have behind them as their leader. Have you ever had it when I've, I've, I've obviously mentored people and been a mentee? But sometimes when you send a member of your team to someone, say, have a chat to this person, they might be a good mentor for you, you know, help you. And they come back and say, oh, wow, it's a really amazing conversation. They told, told me so, so much stuff. And then they regurgitate something that they've been told by this like really wise person. And you're like, I've been telling you that for the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't need to tell you didn't need to learn this from someone else but i've already told you this why do you uh, i think sometimes that person is not objective not your boss not you know not someone that you listen to all day you're used to listening to this person it's like a different voice telling you something some sometimes exactly. gives you that light bulb moment doesn't it yeah and i find uh often with women certainly with me and i see it among my sisters and my friends as well is that we'll talk to each other all the time about everything that's going on whether it's work or home or whatever is on our mind but we won't always like we need that second opinion when it comes to validating our own decisions on things and like say that's where the the support part can come from or like you say an independent like I've, I have plenty of, of female friends across the industry that I may give advice to, but I would always suggest for exactly that reason, talk to somebody else, talk to a mentor who would probably give them the same advice, but it just, for them, it helps to validate. And we'll rarely accept one person's opinion as a validation. It'll always be more than one, um, you know, because that's just how things work. Yeah, exactly. And then sometimes it's a good, it's a good leadership tool, isn't it? You want someone to do something, go and get them to speak to someone else and then they'll tell them the same thing. You're like, they'll come back. And then the other leadership tool I find is say stuff and then like leave it. And then two weeks later, someone will come back and say, I have this great idea. Why don't we do this? Yeah. Like, oh yeah. That's, that's a really good idea. Like that one. <laughs> How did you think of that? You know? <laughs> so yeah, that yeah, I've been telling you. Then you know you've made it if you can do that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I do like <laughs> the idea that you put in people's minds. I read something about Steve Jobs the other day. They were saying, I think they were talking about him developing a new phone and um, or developing the iPhone. And they kept saying like this thing mm-hmm. about and it was actually them putting into his, they said, yeah, I reckon, Steve, if you got onto this phone, then, you know, you'd be really, really, like, do it really, really well. So this is obviously managing up, right? Yeah. And he's like, no, it's a bad idea. We don't make phones. Don't make phones. And then I think someone said, like, the way we got him to do it was we said, well, what about if you thought about how, like, how you could make a phone, Steve? Like, obviously, we're not going to make a phone because Apple don't make phones. But just if you were to actually consider how we might make a phone, then that would be really interesting for you to kind of get involved. And then he kind of came back and 
about two weeks later, I was like, right, I'm sorry, we're going to make a phone. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to do it. <laughs> and then obviously the, the rest is history, as it were. So he obviously did a good job. Of yeah. So, so for, for you yourself, thinking about, you know, the world of like, the actual kind of world you're in, cybersecurity, just as a leader within cybersecurity, what are your particular kind of main priorities for yourself within the technology? Where, where do you see it going in the next year? So I think the the thing people need to focus on more over the next year is still it's best practices. So there's a lot of shift and moving in, in the industry. And especially when it comes to things like we had the, the log for shell vulnerability last December and everyone reacted in panic as often happens with a, a big vulnerability like that. Some are prepped and ready to go. Nobody's ever 100% ready for these kind of things. They either don't have the resources, the people. But when it comes to, to best practices, um, people have a tendency that when their cybersecurity team is quiet, they think, oh, they're doing nothing. So we'll cut the budget or we'll cut the resources or we'll do something like that. When the reality is that when your cybersecurity team is quiet, it means that they're doing a really, really good job. Mm -hmm. So those who are quiet and doing a really good job tend to have their best practices in place. Um, and people need to keep referring back to that. And rather than necessarily focusing on... Um, volume or uh what's the fanciest new thing that they can use they need to always strike at the core for what those be best practices are so there's like key parts like discover assess and um, remediate discover assess, prioritize remediate and then um, measure they're the main keys as such from there and if you're focusing on all of those things then you've got that continuous loop of protection um, and if you're focusing on all of those things and making sure that the tools you have are enabling you to do all of those well, then you're as best protected as you can be. And just try not to drop the ball on that. Everything else tends to fall into place. And there's no there's no 100 percent perfect cover, because at the end of the day, you have humans that are organ that are using your computers and your services and your OT equipment and all of that. And humans are usually where the fault lands with these kind of things. It's it can be a misconfiguration on a device, but who makes the misconfiguration? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If it's the email that comes in that someone clicks on, it's a person who clicked on it. Mm -hmm. So back to, to day one, best practices as always, and everything else then will slap, slap back into place from there. I've noticed recently, like, you know, within our own system, and we're, you know, really like, engage itself as a highly secure business, and I think we do a really good job. There's a lot more use of like you know face ID, you know, in terms of you know, mm -hmm. logins and two auth FAs authorizations in different areas. And I think when they started doing that, it seemed to be quite clunky. But it seems to me that the world of cybersecurity is becoming a lot more, if I dare I say, user friendly. Like they're trying to make it easier for these things to work. Is that is that something that you guys have been working on to, you know, make it easier? Yeah. So actually. Secure? Well, last week we I was with Cyber Women Ireland. I was at the Cyber Summit event in, in Dublin and I was listening to some of the speakers. I was on one of the panels for it as well. But one of the big discussions that was happening during that was how 2FA is becoming a thing of the past. And you could see the wide eyes across the room going, oh my God, I'm only getting 2FA put into my business. Never mind, have it rolling out already. So there was a lot of talk around biometrics and that being something that people are leaning into more, whether it's thumbprints or retina scanners that you're using um, and whilst it is by far safer to do that because you know it is going to be limited to an, an individual to do i think that it led into a conversation about concerns over who owns what data and whether people are going to be happy for you to store the biometric data that they have if it's going to be used for work purposes whilst we'll freely give it away on our iphones that we have for personal use and which Neither you nor I know what's necessarily happening with all of the data that's on that. When it comes to our employer, people have some reservations around that. That's a whole other conversation on the legal side of it. But from a technical perspective, it's definitely um, safer to go down a route like that. You're, you're definitely going to be able to limit that access to the actual individual you intend to limit that access to. And the chances of somebody, you know, having their fingerprint removed shouldn't shouldn't ever happen you know they, there's always a, a failover for those kind of things so i think it's definitely that and ai like there's more of a lean into that kind of technology we don't move as fast ever as we would like and certainly never as fast as the people that are targeting our businesses mm. um but 
it was good to see the conversation open up and people starting to talk about it. And more importantly, those, like I say, who were getting ready to implement 2FA, realizing that they were probably already at least one step behind. And often that's where it begins, understanding how far behind you are on this moving train as such and how much catch up you have to you have to do. So that helps people to address, certainly at this time of the year anyway, to address you know their budgets and their resources and make their plans for next year then too. And when you go into a business or you talk to a customer, you know, or you're thinking about customers, what 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 are the best advice you give to leaders? Because in the end, it kind of flows down from the top, right? You know, they, you know, they you you have to persuade the, the CEO or C level suite people to care about this, and then therefore implement good things. So, what are the best pieces of advice that you can give to people, or what do you try to persuade people of the importance of this? So whether it's a product or a service that you're selling and whether it's related related to cybersecurity or not, if you're keeping the customer's experience at the core of everything that you do, I think that's more than half of your battle because a customer who is happy with your service, happy with your individuals and happy with the product that you're going to sell and feels like you are actually building it around their needs is a customer that's going to stay with you. Um, you know, a lot of companies are focused around being giving the new and shiny every year and getting the new customers every year, where actually much more of their revenue is probably going to be built around retaining the customers that they already have. It's not always the new business. We all want new business, but, you know, we also want to, to keep on board those that we already have. And you'll see even this morning, actually, I was reading an article, I can't remember who it was, but it was about that, about the fact that less and less um, tech companies are focusing on the actual customer quality side of things and the customer experience side of it. And as a result, you know, oh, it was a little, it was like a, a, a ring chart that was with a line down the middle of it that was saying this many people in, or this many failed companies are due to them focusing on new additions rather than customer experience and a little sliver on the end of it being the ones that succeeded because they're focusing on customer experience. And I think as it's one thing that everybody can do, doesn't matter what your qualification is, what your skill background is, what language you speak, you've been a customer of something at some point in your life and all day long, you're a customer of things. So if you can stop for a moment and think, well, if I was using this product or this service, how would I feel about what we're doing right now? Mm -hmm. And if you can keep that on board, it tends to keep your, your team on side with you because the goal is always that of the the end user's best experience and <clears throat> most any team can get behind that but it also keeps your customers on board then too and it keeps you honest for want of a better way of putting it i mean i'm a terrible fibber if i tell you a fib today i won't remember what it was tomorrow and i couldn't embellish upon it and then i won't remember what i was talking about at all so if i'm consistent in my approach always being around the customer experience then i don't ever have to sugarcoat anything or fib about it from there it'll always be the same story that i'll tell so i think that's at the core of anything like say it doesn't matter whether you're making cupcakes or whether you're creating cyber programs then once you keep that at the core of it that's where you keep your customers and do you think obviously I, i'm sure you agree but that's one of the reasons why it's important to have diverse teams right because obviously your customers are diverse absolutely we've you know when you have diversity in your team you're basically making sure that there are no potholes in your story as such if you've got um, only one type of people or traditionally if we've only got you know middle-aged white men which is what we've seen a lot on boards and such in the past then I think that there's a whole mass of businesses and industries out there that we're not either well, we're probably reaching out to them but we're not tapping into them properly because they can't relate to us and um, I mean the best example I've seen is one of the I think it may actually have been the iPhone's health app and we've talked about this before yeah. where, you know, it pushed this great app that covered all of your health features from your blood pressure to your heart rate, all these things. We were one of the first ones out to the market, but it didn't cover, it was it didn't have a period tracker. So 50% yeah. of the people that were using that app were missing a fairly significant feature on it. Yeah. Um, and it's because of the lack of diversity. So yeah. that's that to me speaks volumes. And it's the same, you'll spot it even within your own teams and, you know, even among your friends or Parents outside the school, you know, if there's a diversity, if there's a lack of diversity within the groups that you're around, then there's a lack of full picture in whatever it is that you're doing. It doesn't have to be limited to work, but we talk about it in relation to, you know, the, the tech industry all the time. Everybody has a use for tech. Everybody, man, woman and child and other whatever. We all have a, a reason to use tech. So why aren't we all involved in the creation of those technical items? 
it's not limited only to the middle-aged white man do you know it's yes. everybody else gets to use them too if it was, the funniest part i find is when there's a um, tracker, wouldn't they? <laughs> be overloaded. Be overloaded. The funniest one I find is when there's, men. there's technology created specifically for women, and it's created by men. They're always the ones that give me a bit of a giggle because you can see where they missed the point, you know, entirely. And it's it's just like it's simple to do. The diverse, um, the people that can create your diverse teams or make your teams more diverse are out there and they're looking for positions, but they're choosing the companies that welcome it. And if you go to your, your LinkedIn, you have a look through your newsfeed, you'll very easily see companies who tick the box and promote themselves as being diverse versus companies who are actually diverse. And in, um, June is a great one. If you look at uh, your, your LinkedIn feed or any other feed around June when we have Pride Month, and you'll see everybody change their logo to have the rainbow logo, but you don't see a lot of activity of actual things happening in that business around pride celebrations, whether it's, you know, among their teams or something that they're doing externally. Um, and I know when the, when Tenable celebrated pride here in Dublin, I know lots of people, I put pictures up of the event that we did. We were at the pride parade in Dublin. Um, and I got lots of uh, connections from people after that directly because and they had said themselves, we've seen the, the color flag everywhere, but we haven't seen the, the companies actually do something beyond create the flag so that they were excited to see that there was actual, you know, the name was out there, the people were out there and we were happy to proclaim it. So I didn't even realize until they sent that, that my newsfeed was reflecting the same. I went back then, I scrolled through my newsfeed and I was like, oh my God, it's the, ours was the only pictures I'd seen from companies at the time. Yeah. So, you know, you have to be, you have to promote that you're interested in diversity as a company and yet that you're actually doing something about it. And the the amount of connections and people that are out there that will welcome come into your team, but they don't want to come just to tick the box for you. They want to be there because they're welcome as part of your team for their talents. The diversity is a second to it. And one of the things I know you're quite interested in when you work inside Win9 is obviously, you know, leaders and, you know, and entrepreneurial and, and, and starting businesses, which is obviously another key thing, you know, on top of, you know, entering the industry, dealing with, you know, diversity issues is actually being, you know, in a, like starting businesses. Um, what, what, what sort of kind of conversations do you have and what, what mentoring do you give to people that are looking at starting businesses, you know, within, within that, within that network and within that circle and, and what do you think are important things for people to think about when they're, when they're going into that world? So with regards to the business setup or with regards to recruit, recruitment on that side of things? I think, you know, I think it's, it, it's everything, isn't it? I mean, when you're, when you're looking at scaling up businesses and moving, moving your businesses mm. forward, it's, it's, it's thinking about the whole, the whole element, isn't it? And I think at that point, you're, you're really kind of setting uncharted territory, aren't you? You know, because obviously then you're in a competitive yeah. environment. So it's great to have mentors and people that can can help you. But you know, I know for myself, you know, we've we've built GCS over a number of number of years and had many different, you know, backers and investors and, you know, founders, et cetera, et cetera. But there's always comes a point where I was like, no one can really tell me how to do this right. You know, you've got to take these risks mm. and go for it, isn't it? You know, and, and I think sometimes from yeah, talking to people like yourself who can talk with people and work with people, it's it's giving people the, it's basically giving people the bravery to to take those risks because you have to 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 be successful, don't you? I think. Absolutely, and I think what I've learned from the the mentoring sessions that I've done with people is that in most cases, all they all they need is permission to do what it is that they want to do. Right. Um. You know, a lot of people may have all of the 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 items in front of them and they're say, this is the career I want to move into, or this is the business that I want to set up, or this is the thing I want to study, or I want to change everything about my life tomorrow, yeah. whatever it is that they want to do. They know that they want to do it. They feel it in their gut, the direction that they want to go in, but they just need somebody to say, it's okay to do that. Go first, take the chance, step out of your comfort zone and take, take that risk because often when all of the decisions land with you as an individual, that's a massive weight. And even if it makes no difference to the person that's mentoring you, having them say it's okay to take that risk or take that chance can help lift some of that weight off you as an individual. And I find 
that comes up way more often than I had ever anticipated, whether it was somebody who just wanted to ask for a promotion or somebody, like you say, who wanted to go into business by themselves. And um, generally, I find that people have already made the decision uh, about the thing they're asking you about. They're just looking for the support or, as I put it, the permission to go ahead and do it. Yeah. And for anyone that's going into business by themselves, I can't encourage enough to, you know, if you're afraid of it or you're, you're nervous to do it, take small steps, like take the first few steps. And as things grow and you move in that direction, everything else I find would start rolling. I, I found it when I said I wanted to get involved in all things women in tech and I wasn't connected to anything. This was back in 2018 or so. Um, and I said, anything that pops up in my email and my news feed on my social media, anything in relation to it at all, I'll try and get involved, whether it's handing out leaflets or, you know, whatever. And I did. And nine months later, then I was on the main stage in the convention center in Dublin talking to 1200 people about work life balance for women in tech because I leaned into all those small changes. It didn't affect, you know, my my time with my kids. It didn't affect my work life. I was able to make it all adapt and fit because it was happening at a gradual pace. I took every little small step as it came um, and agreed to those things as they came. So. Taking the first step is the hardest and everything after that is just going to start to naturally snowball, I think. Like you said, like take take that risk, give take that permission and move yeah. it forward. So, so, you know, this is obviously your chance just to talk for those, those who are listening about, about Cyber Win 9 and what's, you said that the, the big launch is coming up. What, 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 what does that entail? You know, what, what can people get out of this particular network that they can't get out of any other network, Jenny? So the, the plan is that we will launch our um, calendar for the beginning of the year going into 2023. We might even do that before the end of this year. We're working on it at the moment. So that will give people information around any of the public events that we're organizing, any webinars, which includes both technical and personal training. There'll be mentorships. There will be promotions. And what I mean by that is um, we will have a part of the site dedicated specifically to promoting individual members so that they, their profile is getting out there as such. We'll have speaking opportunities. One of the things that I've advocated for on the speaking side of it is that we have some experienced speakers and that when we have speakers going to events that for anybody who is new to it, who is interested in speaking, that we do a, a co-speaker um, clause as such that we have two people speak a new and an old so somebody gets an opportunity to participate in a speaking event with someone who's experienced yeah. and ha let them you know get get their chance to come out there and do that it's massive i know b-sides in london do something similar where they have a rookie track and then they have an experienced track and it's good for people to get a feel for something like that and yeah. really hard to get into that and the speaking stuff otherwise like so um, that they're the kind of things that we're working with at the moment. We're opening up membership in the next few weeks. At the moment, we're taking queries from people on membership, but the membership will be limited, not limited, it will be not limited mm -hmm. to um, just individuals. The plan is to have membership for companies and industries as well so that they can sign up and then any of their employees will be able to have membership with us then from there. But the most important part of all of it really is that we'll have solidarity and, and support and be part of that team of Cyber Women Ireland as such, um, where everyone can participate in those events and get together and make that network and you know create those connections that will help them forward their careers. Brilliant, fantastic. And we'll post all the links up uh, when we post up the, the, the podcast and the, and the details and stuff. But um, Jenny, it's been a great conversation uh, today. Um, it was great to see your black giraffe behind you. I remember the giraffe from last time we... <laughs> this conversation it's wonky today i have to <laughs> <laughs> i do wish you well with the launch i'm sure it'll be very very successful and we'll hear much more about it in the future but thank you very much thanks david thank you mm -hmm.